Well, we come to our fifth in a series in the book of Nehemiah, maybe our last. You say, well, it's not over yet. Well, you're right. Um, there's a lot of other good things in the book of Nehemiah, and we may circle back to them uh, eventually, or we may not, and leave it to you at this point to, to read and, and um, uh, be blessed and guided and encouraged uh, along your way. But this morning's theme especially seemed to fit with Father's Day, and so in part we're going to be looking through that lens. But it also broadly, as, as the rest of this series has done, uh, broadly relates to, to where we are as a congregation, to this, this year, uh, particularly this summer of, of discernment, of seeking God's direction and, and, and guidance in, in doing some uh, priority-based planning um, and coming together to, to embrace together a vision for the next several years of, of just how and where and, and on what God would have us to, to focus, um, uh, where our strengths are, where we need to strengthen some other areas, um, where we need to be healthy, uh, healthier than we are even, and, and uh, where growth needs to happen. All of these different things are part of, of this um, this particular time for us as, as a congregation. And so um, we've given, I've given the title to this series, um, Nehemiah, Story of a New Beginning. And um, Nehemiah's story is certainly more dramatic than ours. And so I, I hope that nobody has sensed that by choosing this, that I'm suggesting that, that we're exactly parallel. Um, because we're not. But there is a sense any time that we, we become intentional, whether it's January 1 when we take a look at our lives and the year that's passed and make some New Year's resolutions, whether it's a business or a, or a church family that takes a look and then goes through some assessment and some discernment and together comes up with, with, with a, a, a road map for the next few years, um, whether it's a new chapter in life, there's a lot of opportunities for, for thinking and for planning for fixing or whatever the case might be that, that become a new beginning of sorts. So while our current process of, of, um, of consultation, assessment, and planning, and all of that is, is a sense of a new beginning, um, maybe there's something different in your life that, that you would relate to as well. For Nehemiah, as many of you know, but I'm going to review just a little bit to get us all on the same page. Nehemiah uh, lived uh, the time of, of these events um, were about 445 B.C. And that was 140 years after the destruction of Jerusalem by the Babylonians. The best the brightest, the youngest, carried away into captivity, into captivity in Babylon. Again, that was 140 years earlier. And here is Nehemiah, a Jewish man who is living in Persia, who now controls the region, conquered the Babylonians. And he's living in Persia. He has the job as cupbearer to the king. And though he's never set foot, as far as we know, he's never set foot back in the homeland of his people, somehow that homeland has still been formed in his heart. And as the book of Nehemiah opens, Nehemiah receives a visit from, from some friends, maybe even a brother of his and some other friends who have been to Jerusalem as that freedom has now been extended to some at least. There have been several voyages back, journeys back to Jerusalem. The temple sometime earlier had been actually rebuilt, much smaller scale than it was. Nehemiah knew that stuff was going on back there, that there had been, been different ones who had been scattered, who were finding their way back to, to Jerusalem, and he was very eager to know just how things were going. Here's a chance for an eyewitness report, but... The news wasn't good. Even after all these different groups going back, trying to reestablish themselves, even after the, the temple was rebuilt, 
by and large, the city was still in a state of ruins. The walls were all broken down. There was rubble everywhere. Nehemiah heard that news, and he grieved and mourned and turned to God in prayer. And God formed a plan in Nehemiah's heart over a period of some five months before the day came that God said, today's the day. So Nehemiah sought God's help and said, Lord, give me grace as I go before the king today. Nehemiah asked the king for permission to go back to Jerusalem with the intention of rebuilding the city. And God moved the king's heart to say yes. Not only that, but to, to help supply the venture, the journey, to help ensure safety and travel and, and letters showing that he indeed had permission from the king to do what he was doing and, and even gave him resources from the king's forest to take and to, to use in the, in the project, in the rebuilding. And we've learned a number of different lessons as we've looked at different parts of, of this story. One thing we understood two weeks ago is that there was some significant op opposition from some of the neighbors of Jerusalem and Judea. An individual named Sanballat, another uh, comrade of his uh, named uh, Tobias, and there were some others who um, in various ways tried to discourage tried to stop the work, tried to actually threaten um, the people who were doing that work. We read a lot of that in chapter 4. And I want to give you just a little bit of a glimpse as we set the stage for, for the, our focus this morning. Beginning of chapter 4, when Sanballat heard that we were rebuilding the wall, he became angry and was greatly incensed. He ridiculed the Jews and in the presence of his associates and the army of Samaria, he said, what are those feeble Jews doing? Will they restore their wall? Will they offer sacrifices? Do they think they're going to finish in a day? Can, can they bring stones back to life from these heaps of rubble burned as they are? And then Tobiah, the Ammonite who was at his side, you can kind of I, I, I feel like I'm reaching for some movies where there's always a big villain and then he's got this little mouthy sidekick, you know. And that's almost what this feels like here. Then, then Tobiah the Ammonite says, 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 yes, what they are building, if even a fox climbed up on it, he would break down their walls of stones. And he's thinking, man, that was a real zinger, wasn't it, you know. And he's looking to Sam Ballot to say, huh, that was pretty good, right, you know. In response to that, the people turn to God and pray. Nehemiah asked for God to defend them and to turn these insults back on the heads of those who offered them. So they keep working. They build the wall till it reaches half its height because the people were working with all their heart. Then verse 7, but when Sanballat, Tobiah, and the Arabs, and the Ammonites, and the men of Ashdod heard that the repairs to Jerusalem's walls had gone ahead and that the gaps were being closed, they were very angry. They all plotted together to come and fight against Jerusalem and stir up trouble against it. And then here's the verse we focused on two weeks ago. Nehemiah says, but we prayed to our God and posted a guard day and night to meet this threat. And we talked about how, how in all of life it really is both. There's this, this total dependence upon God, but also this, this faithfulness in doing whatever we know to do. We're not relying on ourselves. Yeah, we're going to post a guard. We're going to try to give ourselves the best chance to survive, the best chance to be safe that we know how. But ultimately, we realize our life is in God's hands. And I think there's this beautiful this beautiful balance, this beautiful coming together of, of turning to God, of, of praying, and yet doing what we know to do. And we're going to see that theme again in just a few moments. But two weeks ago, I shared that it's kind of like the farmer who says, 
when I, when I hoe, I hoe as though it all depends on me. When I pray, I pray as though it all depends on God. And we know that neither one is going to get real far without the other. If he doesn't actually do work of hoeing and planting seed, there will be no harvest. But he can do his work to the best of his ability, and he's still dependent on God to send rain at the proper time. And dependent upon all that God has created in the ground and in the seed and all these things that are far beyond his ability to create on his own. It's both. So we prayed to the God of heaven and we posted a guard. But the story doesn't end there. We read a little further, verse 11. Their enemies again chime in, say, Before they know it or see us, we will be right there among them and will kill them and will put an end to the work. And then to others, they said, Wherever you turn, or some others, who Jews who lived near them, who were not part of the work, came and told them ten times over, basically, it's, it's no use. Wherever you turn, they will attack us. Therefore, Nehemiah says he stationed even more guards. He stationed some of the people behind the lowest points of the wall at the exposed places, posting them by families with their swords and spears and bows. He said, after I looked things over, I stood up and said to the nobles, the officials, and the rest of the people, don't be afraid of them. First of all, remember the Lord who is great and awesome. And then he said this, And fight for your brothers, your sons, your daughters, your wives, and your homes. Once again, we have that that coming together of praying and posting a guard, except in this case, it's remember the Lord, remember who God is, and then be willing to lay your lives on the line. Remember who God is, but remember who it is that you're protecting, who it is that you're fighting for, your brothers, your sons, your daughters, your wives, and your homes. And so I want to take just a few moments and look at this specifically as fathers. And I want to suggest suggest five different things from this passage, some of them very brief, some of them will be expanded on a little bit. Five ways that I think we can look at this, at this story, and draw some parallels to guide our lives. Number one, is I want to encourage our fathers this morning to accept the responsibility of fighting for the safety and future of your family. That's the task that Nehemiah offered to the the heads of the households there, to the the men in, in their day. To remember the Lord who is great and awesome and to fight for their brothers, their sons, their daughters, their wives, their homes. So fathers today, I would encourage you as the men did then, to to hear that call, to remember God, but to accept the responsibility of fighting for the safety and future of your family. Now, don't read into that more than what I intend. Sometimes there there may be times to where where fighting for our families takes a physical form or an active form. Whether it, be, whether it be physical protection or whether it means protecting by doing any number of things, by, by ha- managing finances or by, by going to, to stand up for someone in other ways. There's just a lot that can be involved in this. We're not, we're not just talking about physical fighting or maybe we're not talking about that at all. We need to think more broadly than that but it starts with accepting the responsibility. Second, the second lesson or encouragement this morning is kind of comes alongside of that, is as, as we accept responsibility for, for, let's just say, 
seeking, for, for laying our lives on the line for the safety and future of our family. Secondly, is to live with the knowledge that your actions or inactions have lasting impact on your family. And so that's where it kind of broadens it out, that, that what, what we are willing to do as fathers, what we are willing to step up and do and take responsibility for, or what we, we fail to take responsibility for, whatever it is, whatever our choices, whatever our actions, they do have the potential to have impact, to have lasting impact for good or for ill on our families. And that's actually a part of what it means to accept responsibility, is to recognize that I don't just belong to myself, that I belong to others, especially the family in which God has placed me. The third principle lesson I would suggest, we encourage, is that, that you, that we would embrace Embrace this role as protector of our family. Encourage you, embrace your role as protector of your family as the most important point, the most important part of both your identity and your work. The most important part of who you are. The most important part of what you do. Embrace your role as protector of your family is the most important. More important than your career, more important than your hobbies, more important than some great accomplishment outside of your home. Fourth, and here's the one that kind of broadens this a little bit more, and the one that also narrows it at the same time, you understand what I'm saying, is recognize that at the center of every threat, every danger, every need for guidance, every need for provision, every need for rescue that you or your family will ever face, at the center of all of that exists a spiritual battle. I'm not saying there aren't physical things involved, but at the center of anything, any conflict we face, any danger, any need for guidance, provision, rescue, anything anyone in your family will ever face that needs you to step up on their behalf, and the center of all of that is a spiritual battle. Paul in Ephesians 6 that Greg read for us earlier makes this very clear that, that what, what the battle is that we we face in our lives that which that the greatest battle that that we are in greater than a battle defending the building of a physical wall in Nehemiah's day is a spiritual battle he says he says our battle is not against flesh and blood it's against principalities it's against powers it's against spiritual darkness and you say well what does all that mean well, when we begin to look at what else Paul says for us, maybe we understand a little bit more of where the battle is. He says that the battle is spiritual. It's a battle when he talks about putting on the, the belt of truth. It, it really is a battle for what's true or what's lies. Sometimes that's what the real battle is. We think of with our families is, is battling for truth. Talks about a breastplate of righteousness. Maybe the real battle is righteousness versus unrighteousness. Right living versus wrong choices in life. He talks about a shield of faith, and, and part of the battle is for faith versus for, for doubt and disbelief. Talks about feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace, and sometimes the, the battle is for peace and reconciliation and for wholeness. Versus discord and animosity and hate and division. Talks about a helmet of salvation. The battles for, for redeeming, for saving.
versus destruction, ruin. The center of every threat, danger, need for guidance, provision, or rescue that you or your family will ever face, there is a spiritual battle. And we need to wage that battle with spiritual weaponry, with a spiritual mindset, with spiritual awareness. And the key to spiritual battle is where Paul ends that discussion of the, of the weaponry. And he leads us, he leads us to the weapon of prayer. That's not usually listed when you see the children's diagrams of this soldier in armor and it labels all the different parts of the armor because prayer doesn't sound like armor. But he continues this right after he finishes with the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God, the very next verse, and pray in the spirit on all occasions with all kinds of prayers and requests. With this in mind, be alert and always keep praying for all the saints, all the believers, all your sisters and brothers in Christ. The battle at its center is spiritual. The work at its center is spiritual. For fathers and their families, for our congregation, as we, as we seek God's direction in being and doing what God asks us to be and to do, at its core, that too is spiritual. It's not just about programs. It's not about buildings. It's not about organizing this or that. At its heart, it's a dependence upon God. It's spiritual battle for the hearts of other people to be brought in union with, with the heart of God. Ultimately, that's what it's about. It's not about growing an organization. It's not about filling seats. It's not, it's not about that. It's about God's kingdom, God's righteousness. It's about God's glory. It's about God's heart for all people. And God using us to be channels of his love to serve the way that Christ came to serve, to give our lives the way that Christ came to give his life, maybe not nailed to a cross, but to still fully give ourselves as an expression of God's love, to be living sacrifices, as scripture calls us to be. Interesting. As we go on through this passage in Nehemiah, you say, okay, well, well just how much prayer would be enough? How much spiritual battle, how, how much recognizing the spiritual center is really required here? It's interesting what Nehemiah did in his day. He says, from that day on, half of my men did the work while the other half were equipped with spears, shields, bows, and armor. Interesting that language of armor. And we think of Paul's words of putting on the whole armor of God and the spiritual battle in which we're engaged. We would probably say, oh, it's great, you know, what we really need is people to do the work. And you know, it'd be nice if we had one or two people praying who maybe can't do the work. If you can't do anything else in the church, then maybe pray, okay? I don't know, maybe we have it wrong. Maybe, maybe the real work is the prayer. In this case, Nehemiah took half. He said, yeah, we need to get the walls done, but we cannot succeed without God's blessing and protection. So we're going to have half of you doing the work and half of you standing guard, prepared to fight. Half of you entering battle mode, if you will. Kind of a new thought. Church to say as many people as we have serving in Bible school next week, not this coming, a week from now, that we need at least that many to be in prayer for God to move in the hearts of kids and those of us serving. We don't have those slots listed on our chart like we do for this class and that class and snacks and recreation, but maybe we should. Dads, I know it maybe isn't practical, 
to say, I'm working 40 hours a week to provide for my family. I need to pray at least 40 hours a week. But maybe we take that image and that model and we let that challenge us to at least do differently than we've been doing. There's one more point. And I have that labeled as turn. Part of that was for my own satisfaction because um, as I was putting this together, kind of organize it in a way that the first one, accept responsibility, starts with A. The second one, live with the knowledge, starts with L. The third one, embrace your role as protector is E. Are you getting that A-L-E? Recognize at the center of every threat, we've got R. Can we form a word here? <laughs> Can I have a T word? And that would give us the word alert, because that seems like maybe that summarizes our calling here, to, to be alert, to be engaged, to, be, to take responsibility. So what in the world word could T represent? What's the word turn? Turn away from pride and self-reliance. Turn toward God and toward your brothers. And I'm using that language specifically because I'm still kind of invested here in, in Nehemiah and, and his speaking to the men who were the primary laborers and the primary warriors, but Yet we get the sense that the whole families were certainly involved here. We come down to verse 19, and Nehemiah says, Then I said to the nobles, the officials, and the rest of the people, The work is extensive and spread out, and we are widely separated from each other along the wall. Whenever you hear the sound of the trumpet, join us there. Our God will fight for us. You know, as men especially, but it's something that affects all of us. It's, it's so easy for us to think that, that I'm in this by myself. I've got to do this by myself. And that's never been what God intended. First of all, he never intended us to be independent from him. And the idea of turning to him in the midst of our work, turning to him in the battle in all of life, turning to him fully, trusting him to come alongside of us, to fight our battles for us, with us. And that's hard enough, but sometimes it's even harder for us to turn to others. But Nehemiah set up this plan where even though we're all doing our own part of the work and we're spread apart along this wall, that there would be a signal. And that if, if attack came to one particular area, that a horn would be blown and everyone would gather to the sound of the horn would reinforce that area, would come alongside of that man, of that family, and would fight the battle together. Fathers, we need that mindset as well. We need to know how and when to call for help, to let ourselves be surrounded by others, to have each other's backs, to be open and transparent, in fighting the battles and fighting for our families. To turn away from pride and self-reliance. To turn toward God and toward our brothers. Now this message has been largely for fathers this morning, but I want to close by saying it's, it's for all of us too. Mothers, it's for you too. Same lessons as you fight alongside of your husbands for your families. Or for some of you mothers who are fighting for your families without your husbands. It's for all of us who are part of the kingdom of God, part of his church, whether it's here in this church or in other places. It's for all of us to accept our place to recognize there is a battle, to live with the knowledge that our actions impact others, to embrace our role engaging this battle along with and on behalf of others. It's for all of us to recognize at the center battles for truth, battles for righteousness, 
battles for reconciliation with God, battles for love. All of us need to turn away from pride and self-reliance, turn toward God, toward our sisters and brothers as we face the work, as we face the battles together.